Hi, everyone. My name is Sam, Samantha Evans. I go by Sam. Um, I am a white woman with curly gray hair. I have on purple sparkly glasses and a blue DQ uh, digital ex equity is my jam t-shirt. Um, I'm in my home office and behind me on a wall is an A11Y cats for accessibility cats poster. Um, there are some great people in the accessibility community that run a, a charitable donation fundraiser several times a year with the accessibility cats t-shirts. I bought a wall art piece from them. It is a grid of nine like 32-bit pixelated cats and they have either a visible disability or an invisible disability and uh, so it's good fun on the wall behind me um, and when I wear my t-shirt and give presentations it's a great way to explain accessibility for both visible and invisible disabilities so um, so anyhow if somebody is talking to you about A11Y cats and the accessibility cats or the alley cats um, it's a it's a great program and keep an eye out for it or send me a message and I'll share the link to you to get the details so my name is Sam Evans I work with IAAP the International Association of Accessibility Professionals we are a division of G3ICT which is the uh, Global uh, Initiative for Inclusive Information and Computer Technologies it is an advocacy and policy organization. Um, I am showing my cover slide right now, which has our IAAP logo in the upper left corner, uh, kind of a thought or conversation bubble in black and white that takes up most of the right hand side of the screen that says what's in it for me. So that's what we're here to talk about today is IAAP certifications, what's in it for me. Um, so I'm going to keep us moving forward, we'll get started. And I'm gonna rely on Travis to offer up any questions that come up as we go through the program. So, oops, hang on, I have to make my PowerPoint participate with me. Bear with me just a moment. While she's working on that, just to answer one question that comes up quite a bit, and I should have mentioned this, this session will be recorded and you will have access to it after the fact. <laughs> Thanks, I just had to get my, my enter key on the right screen. So IAAP is a professional organization for accessibility practitioners and professionals around the world, no matter what your role, no matter where you infuse accessibility and inclusion into your programs and services. And um, we have something for everyone, but I'm here to talk about our certification programs. And you do not need to be an, ex you don't need to be a member of the IAAP organization to earn one of our certification programs. So the slide that I'm displaying now is an overview. It says IAAP certification programs is the title. There are two rows of, of round circular badges. They each have a dark blue center with IAAP with a bridged A, which is kind of our bridge around the world. Um, and then the word certified and then the initials for each of the certification programs. Um, in the top left, uh, row is IAAP certified CPACC, Certified Professional and Accessibility Core Competencies, has a red circle around the outside as kind of a color code. We do have a color bar that is displayed on the side of this slide as part of our, our logo identity. So each of our certifications does carry one of the colors as the outside circle. The middle circle in the top row is WAS, Web Accessibility Specialist or WAS. Um, and then the third on the top row is CPWA, that's Certified Professional in Web Accessibility. It has a silver circle because it is when someone earns both the CPAC and WAS. And then on the bottom row for these, for the visual cues here, is CPABE, the Certified Professional and Accessible Built Environments. Uh, and so that is about built environments, physical space, and, and structures. Um, and then IAAP certified ADS is the second on the bottom row. It has a purple exterior circle and it is accessible document specialist. So these are our programs. I'm going to tell you a little bit about each one. We're going to talk about why people pursue certifications and, and then the value that they find in those certifications to their professional world and their lives. So let me talk a little bit about what certifications are and are not. So you'll probably see a lot of people say, oh, I took this class, I'm certified. Actually in the credentialing and licensure world, courses and programs that give you a certificate when you complete a course, 
which they're great because it's a great way to mark your accomplishments. DQ does a great thing of offering certificates when you complete each of their courses in DQ University, which is super. And I love to see people celebrate that. Um, certification programs are not tied to a training course. They're not tied to an academic outcome or an event. So certifications are time limited. Our certification programs are valid for three years and they can be renewed. They require ongoing professional development. So if you earn your ongoing professional development by attending programs like XCON um, and other webinars and educational opportunities, you can maintain your certification and renew them. So um, that's a little bit about the programs. So CPAC is broad core foundational knowledge about, um, I'm gonna move forward onto my next slide. We'll look at this. Certified Professional in Accessibility Core Competencies, or CPAC, is really a great core foundation for everyone. CPACs help shape the accessible future with knowledge about disabilities, models of disabilities and their strengths and weaknesses, adaptive strategies that are used by people with disabilities, assistive technologies and as accommodations, universal design and universal design for learning, the tenets of web accessibility, understanding accessibility laws and regulations around the world. And CPACs are often called on to advise on how to integrate accessibility into an organization. So if you are, if you're working in accessibility, whether you're in marketing, communications, human resources, uh, tourism, hospitality, if you're not on the technical side of accessibility, if you're not somebody digging in and writing, developing, remediating, or auditing code, CPAC, the core competencies, is a wonderful base and a foundation for everyone that works in accessibility or that's getting started and wants to learn and have some core knowledge to have a good foundation. So we find that CPAC, the core competencies, is our first offering and it's the most common. We have about 1800 CPACs in 47 countries around the world. So um, it's a great program. What we find is that as people study for CPAC and prepare for the program, they are learning things about disability and accommodations and accessibility and assistive technologies and the impact on humans and the people, which is why we all do this work, that they maybe aren't touching on in their regular day-to-day -day work. And so um, the preparation for, for the programs is, uh, is always a big enhancement to their life, their world, and their knowledge as well. So um, on this page, we again are showing the IAAP certified CPAC digital badge with the red circle around it. But instead of me telling you about CPAC, I wanted to share what um, some of our, our actual certification holders have to say. So I'm gonna go forward. These are called our CPAC Y stories and each of these screens will have the CPAC digital badge on the left. But I'm gonna start with some of these um, stories that came in from people about why they have, why they pursued the CPAC. Um, so our first story is from somebody that works in sales. And they said that as a salesperson selling digital accessibility services, software and training, the CPAC provided me valuable context and content to discuss the importance of digital accessibility. It also demonstrates to clients that I'm committed to ongoing education and provide the level of clout when making recommendations. Um, so I do have a lot of companies where they do have their sales agents or encouraging everybody that's forward facing and customer facing, take the CPAC so that they can speak from a standard set of terms, knowledge and understanding and speak with some, with some validity when they're talking about accessibility and not just about the product or service that they're responsible for selling and, and delivering. Um, on a more passionate side, one of our other certificates said that I've fallen in love with the space in a way that I didn't think I ever would. My hope for the future is that I'll be working, working, I'm sorry, <coughs> that I'll be working, <coughs> I'm so sorry, working in a training consulting role, but this is the first step in achieving that goal. So um, these why stories are going to be personal feedback pieces from people who've earned the certifications. Um, let me share a few more for you here. There we go. Oh, no, 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 no. So sorry. What happened? What happened to my screen? So sorry, something my PowerPoint has, has jumped the ship. Oops, there we go. Let's come back. There we go. All right. I'm so sorry. <clears throat> So uh, Greg Brunig, who is a CPACC, shared his stories. He is a senior accessibility consultant with, uh, with the Common App Group. 
He says, I was most interested in CPAC and the WAS, the Web Accessibility Specialist Certifications, as sort of a self-validation tool that I was walking the talk. I've been a digital accessibility advocate for the last few years, sharing articles, training developers, writing requirements, et cetera, but didn't have anything concrete behind me aside from the locked away private projects from clients. So on this screen, along with the digital badge, there's also a photo of Greg in the lower uh, left corner um, where he's on a, against a brick wall with a blue blazer and a bow tie and a boutonniere. It looks like he's at a fancy event. So um, Amy Carney is, um, a, is a, is a CPWA, a certified professional in web accessibility. And Amy pursued both CPAC and WAS together. And so she has the credential of CPWA. But her CPAC why story says that I was tasked with web accessibility and remediation at my previous workplace due to a complaint directed through the Office of Civil Rights, OCR. I needed a thorough roadmap for accessibility evaluation and organizational change that went beyond the training that she'd received. So she found that CPAC was a good basis for that training and evaluation that went a step beyond so that she could help make the right recommendations for that roadmap to accessibility. There's a great picture in the lower left of this screen with Amy and she is wearing a striped uh, cow neck top, wearing glasses and smiling and it looks like she has a beautiful art quilt behind her. Um, Erin Evans is a CPACC and she, uh, Erin is a product manager for accessibility and her comment on CPAC and why she pursued CPAC was that I was new to my role in accessibility and I needed to build a solid foundation so that I could effectively champion the importance of accessibility. And then she goes on to say, I'm leading a new role within my business unit. I was offered the role before I obtained my certification, but I chose to pursue the CPAC so that I could more thoroughly understand and champion the work that I was hired to lead. Um, our next why story is from Nell Kineski. I hope I'm not mispronouncing your name terribly, Nell. My apologies. Um, there's a photo of Nell on the bottom left of the screen. Nell is wearing a, a patterned black and white shirt with a black and gold bow tie, wearing glasses, smiling, and they are leaning against a cement wall. Nell's uh, comments, uh, Nell is um, an accessibility manager and advocate and works for the American Anthropological Association. Nell says that as a disabled person and a disability act activist with accessible planning and design experience, it was both curious and learning how accessibility is being professionally approached and also wanted to join a larger community of accessibility professionals. And in speaking about the CPACC program, CPAC, uh, Nell says, it gave me a tangible way to connect with other experts in a field that I thought was less formalized and much smaller than it actually is. So Nell was speaking to the connections community and, and their engagement with other CPACs that they have uh, benefited from and enjoyed a good bit since earning the CPAC. Um, on this slide is uh, Chris Last Lastovica, and there's a picture of Chris in the lower left. Chris is wearing a black sweater with a button-down shirt, wearing glasses and smiling and standing against a wall with a piece of framed art behind them. Um, Chris says that I pursued my credentials so that I would be able to find more work as an accessibility professional. And uh, Chris is uh, actively working uh, freelance as a web developer and web accessibility consultant. Um, Another story from somebody in a different branch of, of work in the professional world is Desiree White. Desiree um, is an IT accessibility analyst at Rutgers University. So Desiree works in higher education. I had the opportunity to work with Desiree um, at a university in a service delivery unit years ago. And Desiree says that I've always struggled with feeling like an imposter. Getting my CPAC was a way to reassure myself that I know my field in addition to all the professional benefits, like a leg up in hiring, reassurance to others that I met a certain threshold of knowledge, et cetera. So I think we find a lot of people are using and finding certifications as a way to establish their get past imposter syndrome. Do I really know what I know? Um, and have a little bit of veracity and something behind, uh, behind what they do already or as an achievement to, to prove that they've, they've gotten that level of knowledge and expertise together. So, um, so we're talking about CPAC right now. And so beyond the information about uh, the why stories, what's really important I think for, for people to understand is also the value. So we can talk about why stories and that's great, but the value add is really what it brings to people to use, whether that's for themselves or, in, or for their companies or organizations. So um, this value story comes to us um, and on this slide, the title is CPAC Value Stories, and there's the IAAP CPAC Digital Badge on the left-hand side of the screen. 
and the, the slide text reads that the context provided through the IAAP body of knowledge and through DQ's prep course prompted me to reflect back on a multitude of experiences to explore a few. What if I'd known questions that were in some, of the, some ways challenging and some ways therapeutic? Some of these experiences have of course been alienating or difficult, but in reflecting on these, I found myself feeling more connected to the larger human experiences that many others have faced. And this helped to further strengthen my resolve to contribute to and positively impact the space in a greater capacity. And I think that's what we hear the most about with people on the value add is really reconnecting with that human experience and why we're working towards inclusion and accessibility and, and the ability to reinforce that at the base core level. But we know we have to talk to you about um, what is happening. There we go. The value stories. Um, Greg Brunig, who we, we saw just a few moments ago um, uh, with our uh, standing against the brick wall with his blue blazer on, the value that sh uh, Greg shares with us in his storyline is that having the tangible outcome of a certificate, a title, and the knowledge required to acquire the certificate, I'm much more confident in my accessibility work. While still working towards the WAS, the CPAC allowed me to pitch improved accessibility work at our organization by framing it through non-technical terms and business needs. So despite, and he jokes again, that despite being out of school for 10 years, that at this point, that he learned he can still study, take and pass an exam too. So a little bit of humor there from Greg, which was kind of a bit of fun <clears throat> as we were having these interviews. There we go. Aaron Evans, uh, who we read a bit from before on CPAC, um, talks about their value story from them. And Aaron is wearing a blue V-neck t-shirt, smiling uh, with curly dark hair, standing against a white wall. Aaron says, I'm not an expert in accessibility, but thoroughly understanding the basics allows me to speak with authority to open conversations that lead to change. My whole role is centered around accessibility. I explain the core competencies to different teams and champion the importance of accessibility for all. I look at everything differently now. I have a broader understanding of the barriers that people face that I personally have never had to consider. So um, I really enjoy hearing the, uh, the impact stories on these values. Chris Lastovica is gonna contribute here again. Um, Chris says, my credential has enabled me to work on both contract projects and in full-time employment as an accessibility professional. I learned far more preparing for my certification than I realized I would learn. And I've used knowledge about laws, disabilities, and assistive technology to help describe to others the importance of digital accessibility. So I know for a lot of people, certification is, is it going to help me in my career? And, and these are real world stories of people that are actually earning opportunities and progressing through their career stories, thanks to their certification in addition to their work and their skill set. So Stephen Lewis is a senior legal counsel for Capital One in Canada. And Stephen says, personally, the credential process and ongoing education have been personally fulfilling and expanding my knowledge for my job. Some of the international specific materials as I work for an international company, my work in accessibility has crossed borders, and I found I already had familiarity with different regulations in Europe and the United States from preparing for CPAC. So um, just some areas of, of how the value add in CPAC has contributed. Ravi uh, Venkata is a senior product manager for RCG Global Services in India and says that preparing for the exam helped me understand the wide range of topics in the accessibility domain and how universal design principles and other factors play into building an accessible product, both physical and digital. He says that my company and I benefited from the credentials by offering additional services to our clients and build confidence about the ability to design and develop for accessibility users. Desiree Wright's gonna come back for one more uh, about her value story that this is a helpful marker to potential employers that you know your stuff, you can be trusted to help them. Having to keep up with cakes, which are continuing accessibility education credits has been helpful as a reminder to myself to center the individual and as a reason to ask my employer for professional development. Because I have a CPAC and I understand the broad foundational knowledge it represents, I was able to argue for listing CPAC and WAS certifications as preferred qualities on the positions that, she, that I've hired. So that's a little bit about CPAC. Do we have anything, Travis, that we need to stop and talk about CPAC before we move on to WAS? We have <laughs> um, we have quite a few questions. Okay. Um, let, let me pull one. Some of them are related to WAS, the one with the most upvotes, actually. So I'll hold okay. off on that one. All right. Um, I've got one that probably covers quite a few questions, um, but it's a pretty good summary. 
It says, um, at what stage in my career would you recommend getting certified? I'm just starting out um, a year and a half full-time work and considering CPAC. So I think when you have about a year or so in is is probably where you'll have at least some exposure and understanding for contextual knowledge. Um, I think anyone anywhere along their career path um, is at the right time to start. Today's a great day <laughs> to start um, and and take a look through the the content outline and the body of knowledge to to get a feel for what what it looks like and see how that feels for where you are professionally and personally right now and and what what in your world, your life, your home uh, would allow you time to prepare and dig in to look at it. But I think anybody who's got at least a year or so in, um, in accessibility and inclusion is probably a really good time to, to, to take in and, and consider certification. Um, they are professional certifications. So they're designed for people that are actually either working or passionate advocates. So I hope that helps. That, that's a great answer. Um, there's another, theme or pattern that I've sort of recognized in the questions. And uh, because I work for DQ, full disclosure, I would like this to be answered objectively. Okay. Um, but there's a lot of interest in um, how much value is really in the DQ um, prep courses and how representative are those of the actual testing? Should, does it need to be memorized letter by letter? Or, um, you know, can you talk a little bit about how those prep classes tie into the actual certification? Okay, that's a great question. I answer it all the time. So fully objective here. <laughs> um, <laughs> yep, I'm, so, that's why you, you're... <laughs> <laughs> so all of the exam questions, when we write an exam question, our subject matter experts take from the study objectives and the learning objectives in the body of knowledge document. And that's where we write our questions from. So the body of knowledge and the content outline should be where you start and base your study. DQ's prep courses are great. They are great addition to studying for the exam. So you should use them in addition to your body of knowledge, research, and study. The questions, it, so, and one thing to clarify so that DQ doesn't get held to some weird standard, DQ prep courses and any of our approved prep courses, the way that it's mapped, it says this course maps to a content outline, domain one, section A or domain two, section A. So it maps to the content outline. It doesn't teach to the exam. We actually don't allow people who create training programs to have had, they might've taken the exam, but they don't have access to the exam prep. So the questions that DQ asks on their prep, on their prep courses are more like quizzes and a little less than exam. Um, there's no true faults on our exams. There's no all of the above. There's no double negatives. So it's all multiple quizzes. choice, right? Hmm, sorry, they're all multiple choice, radio button selections. So the courses are great. But I think what people may get confused about is thinking that the quizzes in the DQ courses are what the test is like. We one to one. Yeah, right. Okay. So that's a great are, distinction. I've heard that confusion myself in the field. Yeah. So I hope that helps answer that question. I think we're good to, to move forward into WAS. It, it, can, do you mind if we take one more? Oh, absolutely. Uh, th so there's a ton about recertification and maintaining certification. Mm -hmm. I'll save those till the end because you, you're sprinkling that throughout. You've talked about it a little bit. This mm -hmm. one is a really good question um, unrelated to that. Uh, it says, testing presents substantial barriers for those of us with cognitive disabilities. Mm -hmm. The use of testing to judge ability and knowledge can be very harmful to those with mental health and cognitive disabilities, um, i.e. test anxiety. Uh, what is the IA... Uh, AP doing to promote inclusion of neurodiverse professionals? I thought so, that was a great question. So it is a good question. And as we go through and revise our, our scenario writing and our questions, we are um, incorporating more considerations for plain language and less cognitive load on the questions. As far as the test taking exam process itself, we work with each person on how best they um, can engage with the, the assessment as a multiple choice exam. We offer additional time. We allow readers, we allow recorders. Um, and we do have some people that prefer to engage in an audio format. So we have readers and each person can make their accommodation request for what's the best experience for them. And we are working to uh, revise and update and engage the content delivery for the exam questions as well. So um, on exam for applications for accommodations, people can request additional time. All of our exams are set for two hours. Um, additional time can be requested for disability. Um, we don't request documentation. 
Um, and if English is not one of your primary languages, you can also ask for additional time as an accommodation as well. Great. I, I hope that answered that question. Um, yeah, let, let's, let's move ahead. All right. And um, we've got some queued up for later. Okay. So WAS is the Web Accessibility Specialist in parentheses WAS at the top of this page. Um, on these slides, the WAS logo will be on the right-hand side. But Web Accessibility Specialist is an intermediate technical program. It's designed for people that have the minimally qualified candidate, um, if you're looking at a persona, has about three to five years of exposure and experience to actual interactive web accessibility components on the back end, as well as usability and accessibility testing and audit and remediation. So WAS has helped shape an accessible future with knowledge of creating accessible web solutions. So in WCAG 2.1, that includes ARIA, ATAG, normative and non-normative data. So I've got the people impact, not just the code and compliance. The impact of accessibility for people that rely on web solutions, identifying accessibility issues in web solutions. So that's accessibility and usability testing with a variety of assistive technologies understanding the limitations of automated testing solutions, plus the value of manual testing, in addition to automated testing as a best practice. Remediating issues in, in web solutions to so the level of severity and prioritization of issues and recommended strategies to incorporate accessibility. So I'm gonna move to some, some why stories for WAS and we're gonna, we're revisited here with Amy Carney, whose picture is on the lower right this time. Amy says, I wouldn't have envisioned myself becoming an accessibility professional. I just wanted to be better at my craft, web design and development, and make my workplace's services more accessible. The more I took on, the more I wanted to get better at accessibility and teach others the same. This was a newish direction that was greatly impacted by choosing to learn more and get certified. So um, I'm going to keep going here. Uh, Rochelle DiTulio, who's a CPWA, has a uh, illustrated almost cartoon effect uh, image of her as a from the shoulders up looking up to the upper left is her icon and that's on the lower right of the screen. Rochelle says that when I learned about them at Access U in 2018 I was excited I could get a professional certification for the accessibility work I've been doing on my own and the CAEC that continuing accessibility education requirement ensures that I keep learning. I attend one to two webinars a month to do free training and attend conferences to keep up with accessibility changes and trends. That speaks a little bit, uh, Travis, to that question about continuing education. Uh, thanks. Yeah, and we'll talk about the requirements on that. But Beatrice Gonzalez uh, Mayida is, is a CPWA and her photo is her laughing at a beach with windswept hair brushing across her face and she's laughing, smiling. Beatrice says, I'm the only one certified in my company, and we have used it in at least one pitch where we're, where accessibility was a must. Having a credential that's internationally recognized and my engagement in the accessibility community were a differentiator to our offer. That speaks a little bit to the value add of how companies and groups are using their certification status to differentiate themselves from other vendors in the technology space. So... When somebody earns both CPACC and WASP, C W A S, they earn, we grant a third credential that is CPWA and the silver ringed logo for CPWA is on the left. CPWA shape an accessible future by bringing a strong foundational knowledge of disabilities, adaptive strategies and assistive technology. They complement essential components of universal design and web accessibility, integrating intermediate technical web accessibility skills and accessibility core competencies. Enhancing understanding with experience in, accessi in, in accessibility and usability testing of web solutions. And then also to, they can help to um, help to advise teams and integrate accessibility best practices and design policy and technical areas across an organization. So um, on the CPWA, Amy Carney does have both. Amy comments that the journey learning of the certification was the most important goal rather than the certification itself, especially for the WASP certification. The certification itself is a perk to the ultimate outcome of well-rounded and in-depth understanding. Under more why, why stories from Rochelle, um, when I learned about, so the, hang on a second, where, why are we, there we, oops, hang on a second, sorry, my slides are going in the wrong order. So. Beatrice Gonzalez uh, says that in order to get a refresh in the topics covered and learn some more as a way to overcome imposter syndrome and value my knowledge better, I'm working as an accessibility SME and leading accessibility efforts within my company and with the wider Accenture community worldwide. Beatrice is a principal product designer for um, Center Strader, which is an Accenture company in Germany. 
Radek Pavlicek is in, from the Czech Republic. He's a senior accessibility expert at his university. And he notes that due to its international reach of the IAAP certifications, it helps in their EU funded projects, the European Union funded projects. They're perceived as more credible for our project partners. And I use the knowledge every day during my tasks and activities related to accessibility. Radek is seen in the lower left with wearing glasses and a plaid shirt. So we also talked about the built environment program. Travis, do we need to stop before I get into built environment? Do you have questions about what? Um, there was one that had quite a bit of votes. Let me okay. see, where did it go? Um, I am currently preparing to take the WAS exam. Oh, <laughs> it, it's again, how representative uh, is the DQ question? So I think you kind of answered it earlier, even though we were still in CPAC, it's probably similar, it right? Is. But if on, on our website under certification menu, there is a prepare for page for WASP and CPAC and included in both of those are some sample questions. So that'll be a great resource. There, there, to... Okay, ahead. great. There's also been a few questions about the, um, the, the body of knowledge or the book of knowledge. Is that on the IAAP website or where, where is it that is. found? It is okay. under on each of the certification programs has a prepare for page that you can get to from the main certification guide. Uh, the main first page and the body of knowledge is listed along with the content outline. They are uh, digital PDF that are tagged, bookmarked, and navigable. So, awesome. Okay, yeah, let's go. Let's move forward. So, the Built Environment Program is a new program. The Certified Professional and Accessible Built Environment (CPABE). Uh, its logo is on the right with an orange circle around it. Uh, our built environment professionals, CPABEs, help shape an accessible future by auditing built environments that include digital components of space and structures, understanding and applying best practices in universal design, including smart technologies, and implementing accessibility standards, codes, and international legislation for knowledge <clears throat> that's specific to space and building purposes. And they present findings to built environment teams so they understand the relevance of accessibility uh, for people. And the built environment program has three levels. There is an uh, associate, which is somebody with three to five years experience, um, advanced, which is somebody with five to seven years of experience and the expert level, which is level three, that is somebody who's got 10 plus years of experience. This is for actual people that are doing assessments, recommendations on drawing and design and audits of actual built environment spaces um, as their primary role in their professional careers. So, while we are all familiar with built environment spaces, we're really pleased to be able to bring that into the mix at IAAP for people that are doing this work. It's not a learn it and take a test for you. This is for people that are physically working regularly in standards, assessments, and audits for the built environment in public spaces. We will have on our learning management system, I think we'll start in April. It's a design of public spaces course that is a, a kind of a prep course and it's complement to people that are starting out in their career in built environment. So stay tuned for that coming soon. So I'm gonna move on to accessible document specialists. So um, I know that documents are a hot topic right now and there are a lot of things that have your choices. What's the best way to present this information? Should it be presented on a web page, or does it live in a document? So we're always gonna have documents. They're gonna to continue to be with us. And um, while it's a really great idea for people to present information in HTML on a website as well. Some things will live in document format. So our accessible document specialist is a new program. It's presented with a purple ring around the outside and ADS is the acronym. So ADS is shape an accessible future by creating accessible documents in authoring formats, remediating documents in a variety of formats, auditing and testing documents for accessibility and usability, understanding and explaining the limitations on automated document testing, documenting accessibility training and planning, establishing accessible workflows and best practices for um, educating and integrating accessible document um, into programs and services and advising on policy and advocacy. So on the ADSY stories, uh, I have three slides. This is one of three. Um, this contribution is from someone who earned the ADS in our pilot program. And they contributed that approaching it from a graphic design perspective, I think that accessibility guidelines could be applied easily during the document creation process. Graphic designers are already thinking about document structure, hierarchy, color, contrast, and many of the other aspects that WCAG tests for. So establishing organized best practices would give designers and others a tool set on how best to achieve baseline and amazing accessibility. On our story two of three for ADS, 
uh, the contribution says that our department is over 25,000 employees and we have only one team doing document accessibility. Auditing it becomes very important to push for established standards. Our team's not big enough to audit all documents. It becomes super important for us to educate content authors on creating accessible documents and to do so inclusively and from the start of the process so that's not an afterthought. Story three for ADS here. By providing standards and best practices, we can educate document creators so accessibility is included from the beginning, thus reducing the need for remediation. Providing the professional certification for anyone who produces documents will give certificate holders a benefit on applications and resumes. How are we doing out there, Travis? What kind of questions do we have hopping up? Um, they are, we have a lot of... Okay. Um, questions that are similar to the ones you've already answered. Um, how about, I was wondering if there's a review body that actually has a sample exam. Um, like when we uh, do entrance exams for college or CPA or NSAT and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, can, can you speak to that a little bit? And th this, this uh, uh, person that asked this question is um, somewhere in Asia. Okay. So, we have, uh, we're really excited coming in April, Princeton University developed a, a preparation course and part of their preparation course includes a sample exam for CPAC, for CPACC. And so the, the, on, the course will be on our open edX LMS and the course has 10 hours of content plus a sample exam for CPAC. Um, but what we want people to do is to study the content and learn the context and the applications versus trying to learn to test the questions. So we do have sample questions on the prepare for page. There are 10 sample CPAC questions and eight sample WAS questions on the prepare for CPAC and prepare for WAS pages. And we'll, we'll look to, to build more as we go. Um, but building quality sample questions takes a lot of time. Um, it's not like writing a quiz or maybe even as simple is complicated as a college exam level test. Um, and uh, they do get updated. So we do have sample questions, but not sample exams at this time. I imagine oh, at about the six, at, at probably in another year or two, we'll have sample exams for more of the programs, but we just haven't built that yet. Okay. Um, here's one, this is uh, likely somebody who works in the government. I thought this was a good question. Um, they asked it quite a while ago. Uh, it says, I know this is early, but um, how do I prioritize or think about and decide between IAAP certifications and the trusted tester program courses? It's a really good question. So the trusted tester program, which is a brilliant way to teach an auditing and remediation methodology and approach that uses the ANDI or ANDI tool is a great way to learn about methodology for auditing. Not everybody who does audit um, auditing understands the underlying building blocks of semantic code and tags and labels and how and why they're used. And a lot of people who do audit and remediation testing don't participate actively in doing usability and accessibility testing. So I think that Trusted Tester and WAS are really nice complements to one another. Neither of them is a replacement for the other because the, if you take purely just the audit remediation practice and, and methodology from Andy, you can transfer that to other topics and other skills and other tools. But WAS includes a little bit more of a build for understanding the technical code elements. What happens if this code were to render? How do you identify things? What happens when you open code inspect and usability testing and accessibility testing, which is a step beyond what most audit teams do. I hope that answers that question. So I would say if your role is audit remediation and you're required to follow the, the Andy methodology, you'd certainly do trusted tester first. But if you wanna build out your skills and a little bit more knowledge on the technical proficiencies of the actual building of code elements and usability and accessibility testing, the WAS would be a really nice compliment. Great, thank you. Um, time for one more before we go. Yeah. Uh, so I thought this was really good and it's popular in um, the Q&A. Um, this is from Crystal and she says, she asks, in light of the economy and the impact that the pandemic has had on funding uh, in higher ed and even uh, economic status of higher ed employees, is the IAAP doing anything to offset their costs in a time when we need accessibility professionals even more? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, we Curveball were, for you. Well, yeah. So, um, 
for IAAP members, there is a, a discount if you're a member of the organization. And if the if your organization is a member, then everyone is eligible for that discount. Um, we are looking to establish a scholarship fund uh, for people that have, are experiencing uh, economic hardships. We don't have one in place at the moment. But what we've been really surprised by is that while we expected 2020 with COVID to really have a really serious dip down negative impact, we uh, saw a huge growth actually given the conditions. Okay. Um, so accessibility is growing and building. And um, so we hope to be able to offer some more um, economic hardship scholarship opportunity. We have to establish that, get the donations in place. Um, and uh, so I imagine that we will see some of that coming soon. So, uh, but we do have people that contribute their uh, honorariums and other programs to offer scholarships. And when they do, we, uh, we're happy to help cover the cost. So reach out to us and we'll have a further discussion if you're interested. Awesome. Um, there's one other that kind of dovetails right into that real quick. Uh, this says, how do people pay for the exams? Do their employers pay? Um, or is it something um, that you typically pay for to get a job in the field? And especially for people with disabilities uh, or unemployed people and students? So it, it really depends. So we do have a lot of vocational rehabilitation agencies that have scholarship funds where they will pay for um, and career service agencies that will cover the cost as part of training and development um, in that branch of things. Uh, companies often will pay as part of professional development and a lot of people will pay for it on their own um, as part of their endeavor or their investment into their future. So uh, it, it really depends. Just like accessibility, it depends and it's, it's different for each person. We do offer invoicing Great. for companies um, and we're happy to work with any career coach or training program that has the ability and wants to help support your endeavor. And I, you know, we, we also offer a scholarship um, on DQ University for people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to shamelessly plug that in the chat Absolutely. as well, because I think that's um, valuable and, and I'll, I don't hear a lot about it um, in the wild. So I think it's kind of an undiscovered thing. So I'm going to drop that in the chat. Um, I, share and I'll, that we'll on my weekly drop, I share that on my weekly drop in almost all the time for if you're a person with a disability, the DQ university programs are offered um, are free of charge. And I think it's amazing education training opportunity. So if that is you, I would take full advantage of it. Yeah. And similar to you, we don't, we don't require undo, you know, documentation, documentation and stuff like right. that. Yeah. Um, I think we took a cue from you guys on that. <laughs> all right. We'll let you continue. All right. So. So ideally, IAAP's mission is really to advance awareness, education, and networking of accessibility practitioners and professionals. So what we find is that our certification holders are building an accessible future. So we're providing guidance, advice, and services to remove barriers and make the world a more accessible place to demonstrate your personal commitment to accessibility as a profession. And we have to think about that. We know what accountants are, we know what lawyers are, you know what people that work as project managers are, but accessibility is still trying to establish itself as a known profession. And so certifications and participation in professional community is a way to demonstrate that commitment uh, to the profession and to inclusion. But it also helps advance the roles and responsibilities of accessibility professionals by distinguishing these unique skills and knowledge. Leaders in accessibility are go beyond um, just making leadership changes and recommendations because they are change agents that starts from the top and works from the bottom and both sides in. So part of that though is establishing benchmarks and standards for accessibility professionals and practitioners. What at a minimum should somebody know? Um, and how do you determine that? And what should people do um, in action and activity? What kind of knowledge do they have? How do you increase awareness and recognition for this accessibility profession that we all work in? And to highlight and designate if it's a company, an organization or a team to designate and differentiate your commitment to the ethos of accessibility and inclusion into your culture and have your company or your organization stand out or your team. So um, this is really questions and answers for you. I'm happy to answer more. I will say that we do have uh, drop-in sessions. I'm gonna forward beyond this, what's in it for you questions and answer slide. Um, you can contact me at any time. Um, 
IAAP is united in accessibility. So we're building this international community of accessibility professionals together. But let me know how I can help you succeed. You can contact me at certification at accessibilityassociation.org. And you can check out our guide to certification, which is listed on this slide, which is https colon forward slash forward slash www accessibilityassociation.org forward slash certification. And on this slide, which will be available later, are our Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube icons. But the rest of this time is just for you. So I'm here to answer questions. Let's see what we've got. Um, here's one that was in chat that somebody was kind enough to bring over into q and says, I'm a UX UI designer, but I do not code. Does that mean that the WAS isn't for me? It doesn't mean it's not for you, but it might mean you've got to do a, a bit more work to hands-on exposure to open up your code inspect and learn what the back-end things look like. Because if we're going to fix, audit, remediate, or diagnose and usability test, understanding the key code elements and how and why they work is important. So it doesn't mean it's not for you. It just, you need to look at those learning and study objectives in the body of knowledge and see how familiar you are with those technical terms, understanding what's normative, what's non-normative in WCAG. Um, the normative is how you test for compliance. The non-normative is the usability impact on the person. So I think, is that a fair way to express that, Travis? I think so, yeah. So I would take a look at the, the learning objectives in the body of knowledge and see where you'd want to spend some time studying, prepping, and getting your, getting your hands into the meat of the code under, under the hood if, for a car reference. Yeah, I, I think somebody with, with that skill set could definitely pass mm -hmm. the course um, with, without learning a bunch of new um, stuff they don't already know about code, but it's, it, you know, thinking about it the way that you presented is this going to be valuable in my career. Um, there's, a, there's been quite a few questions about how to find out specific um, pricing information. How much okay. does, this, does this certification cost? So each certification has its own price point, and we do have a page on our drop-down menu under certification on the IAAP website, which is pricing, discounts, and payments. So, so we have a non-member price, if you're not a member of IAAP, an IAAP discounted price, and an emerging and developing economies price. So um, for CPAC, the non-member <clears throat> non price is 485 USD, and then an IAAP member is 385. And if you're working in an emerging and developing economy, I think the discount is $170. So it's a, about a 60% discount. If you work in, live and work in an emerging, developing, or transitioning economy from the United Nations list, with the exception of UAE. So ADS, uh, WAS, and CPABE, the Built Environment Program, start at 530 for non-members, 430 for, for members, and I think 270 is the discounted price down for emerging developing economies. But you can find those prices on our pricing, payments, and discounts webpage. If somebody's a full-time student um, and not working while they're going to school at a university, I have a lot of people who try to say, I'm a member of DQ University. I said, great, that's great for you, but that's actually not an accredited institution of higher education. <laughs> hey, 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 come on. <laughs> it is, it's a great program. So, but if somebody is a full-time student um, and not working full-time, uh, they could apply for an IAAP student membership, which would also grant them that $100 discount off of each exam. Excellent. Um, here's one that's near and dear to me, uh, that it's come up a couple times. What this is, this is from Karen. Um, what is the, or Kieran, if I'm not saying that properly, what is the usual pass fail rate? I have anxiety about failing. Right. So, do you have any statistics on that you can share? I do. So we don't publish the cut score. So we don't say get X number of questions correct or not, but the pass rate on CPAC is about 89%. For people on their first, wow. its first pass, because the body of knowledge is very specific, and you can read and study and learn the context very well. Um, WAS, so and this is going to scare some people. The WAS success rate is about sixty-three to sixty-four percent, but let me explain why. Because forty-five to fifty percent of the people who apply have less than one year's experience in web accessibility and are convinced they can study and learn contextual knowledge and applied experience. Yeah, to take that, an experiential knowledge exam. That brings up another theme that I've seen in the Q and A. Um, in that, is there 
uh, sort of a hierarchy to, you know, do you need to take CPAC first and then move on in a certain order, or is it really case by case based they on are, your they uh, are, <clears throat> Whichever program best meets your needs is, is the best match for you. Um, there's not a prerequisite of one exam before the other for any of our programs right now. We may in the future build a program that says you have to have a CPAC in order to take an additional, but not at the moment. We have probably time for one more question. I, I, this is the part of my job that hurts because we have so many good ones in here, but here's a good one. WCAG3 coming down the road. This is from Phil. What are your thoughts on how that change, um, parenthetical, a big one, will affect the WS exam content and its timeline for changing with that upcoming update? So we will be updating WAS for 2.2 later this year, and we're looking at silver and what's going to happen with 3.0. As I understand, and I'm not on the council, I'm not on the committee, and this is my off the top, I believe that 3.0 is going to be something to consider for evaluation and assessments of how usable, accessible things are in addition to meeting the technical standards. When we get closer to the publish of Silver, we will we will take a deeper dive in for WAS and see. We obviously will have to change the content to include the the rubric, the scoring and evaluation that's involved with WCAG for Silver. Um, so we'll know more about that probably closer to the end of 2022. Great. Okay, I think that answers that one. Um, with that, unfortunately, we are at time. Uh, so. Reach out to me. You can follow me on Twitter, LinkedIn, um, Sam Spears Evans on LinkedIn, you know, Sam Evans on Twitter. Um, I do a lot of advocacy on Twitter. So if advocacy for inclusion isn't your thing, maybe not it, but if it is, come join us. Slides are available on the um, session page at x-con.com where you are likely watching this right now. Um, so if you want to grab those, just scroll to the bottom. And you can also see more information about Sam down there as well. And every Wednesday, I have drop-in sessions in the morning and the afternoon, Eastern, 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. about certification. And there's an RSVP form on our main certification webpage. So let's come talk to Awesome. Me. Sounds Thanks like an invitation, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the conference.